Uh, greetings, BSD Can. Uh, welcome to our talk on the stack, free BSD from a vendor's perspective. Uh, please also welcome uh, my colleague Faraz. Uh, a short intro about us. Uh, I'm Antranik Vartanian, a co-founder and CEO of Luria Security. I also run Armenia's uh, BSD user group as well as uh, multiple local uh, tech projects um, for us. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Faraz Vohedi, a systems engineer from Luria Security, and I'm so chuffed to be here discussing our release process for you. Uh, okay, let's go directly into our agenda. First, a short description about what we do, uh, how we chose an operating system for our appliance, uh, why we ended up with FreeBSD. I'll go over our development flow from non-FreeBSD uh, bits such as Git and the building to more FreeBSD stuff such as Poudriere, releasing an ISO on a VM image, etc. Uh, we'll talk about unforeseen issues that we've encountered and how we fix them. Uh, then I'll give you a bunch of links that hopefully will be useful to you and, you know, in the end, typical Q&A. Um, so what we do, we are a cyber deception company. Uh, I, like, uh, I, li I like to call it um, honeypots on steroids. Uh, basically, we create a virtual minefield inside infrastructures to detect, deceive and deter attackers by using uh, decoys and lures to break the attacker's decision cycle and forcing them to reveal themselves. Um, so, um, spoiler alert, usually the answer is free BSD with some exception uh, when you're choosing an operating system, the main one being embedded systems with specific drivers. For example, I worked on smart boat and we had to use Linux to be able to control the boat um, due to some technical limitations. Um, the other most common exception is when your team requires a specific tool um, because let's say they are integrated into, into an ecosystem. For example, Docker would be, would be a good example here, which is not available on FreeBSD. Uh, but this case is becoming less and less common. Uh, these days. Uh, now we do have our own uh, business uh, business needs. Uh, I'll try to talk about vendorship in general and also our own story. So in our own story we needed a system that is not PETA and that always followed the principle of least astonishment. Uh, something that was commercially friendly with a nice responsible community um, and ideally with a single source of truth that would be easy to replicate and own. So these, uh, these were our main um, options to consider. Uh, the first one was obviously Linux. Um, we did have uh, legal issues with GPL and we didn't want to violate the work of other people. Um, Linux, you know, also changes very fast. It's, uh, it's hard to maintain. Uh, I think most of us here encountered such issues before, you know, if config being removed and now you have to maintain more things, etc. It also has a very divided community uh, it, in, in the sense that it's hard to get proper answers you know, proper and quick answers. Everyone has their own way into, into, into a solution uh, of, a, of a problem. Uh, the next option was actually Lumos, since our technical requirements were advanced file systems like ZFS, a tracing facility like D-Trace and, um, uh, and an isolation technology like Zones. Uh, Illumos made the most sense. Unfortunately, um, it was unknown to the majority of our team and teaching it would be hard to people who had lots of experience with Linux and little experience with BSD. It was, it was different compared to, to other Unix-like systems. And next, obviously, it was uh, FreeBSD. So it already had uh, ZFS and D-Trace. Um, it, technically, it's the master innovator in isolation technologies with jails. Uh, FreeBSD made a lot of sense uh, and uh, since we were using it in previous projects, we already knew the nuances, we knew where to ask what in our community um, and there was, you know, the single solution for a single problem mentality in our community. Um, of course, sometimes those problems would have been around for years, but you know, that's a story for another day. Uh, we also encountered, uh, we also considered uh, NetBSD and OpenBSD. While NetBSD does have um, D-Trace and ZFS, we really needed an operating system level uh, isolation technology. And uh, OpenBSD, while it, it runs on our routers, uh, it, it does not have the features that we needed. <coughs> 
So um, as a vendor, uh, assuming you chose FreeBSD as well, uh, here are some niceties that it has. First, um, we came for the license and we stayed for the technology in the community. Amazing things are built into the base system itself, such as uh, ZFS, Dtrace, uh, GILs, and uh, many, many more things. Um, many nice things are developed with the base in mind, such as Poudriere, um, VMB Hive, um, and, and, and DWatch. It's, it's, it's easy to fork, however, a little tricky to maintain, especially for a startup. Uh, speaking of which, here are a couple of disclaimers of our journey. Uh, we're a startup, so we're a team of five people working on everything. We're a startup, so we can't just spend $500 a month on a build server. Uh, we're a startup, so we can't wait hours until things compile. I'm looking at you, LLVM in base. Uh, we're a startup, so we can't afford giant resources. Uh, we're a startup, so we want to focus on our core problem. Um, but we're also a team of uh, BSD lovers. Uh, now I'm going to talk about our stories. I hope it become it, it, it helps you to become a free BSD based startup, free BSD based startup as well. Um, uh, here's the list of our tech stack. Um, it's it's uh, on the software side of things. Of course, we use FreeBSD. We write a lot of Elixir, Erlang, OTP, a lot of FreeBSD shell code, the JavaScript for the front end, obviously. Uh, Oberon. If you know what Oberon is, then you're really lucky. It's a very minimalistic programming language. We also have some components in Rust as well as C. Uh, for continuous integration, we use BuildBot. Uh, it's more like a meta framework for building your own CI system. Um, keep in mind that you could be using GitHub Actions or GitLab CI, it wouldn't make any difference. Um, for version control, we're using a Git on a Git. -y. Again, you could be using GitHub or even not Git at all. It, it wouldn't make much of a difference. But on the FreeBSD side of things, we use Poudriere to package our software and a bunch of scripts that we will go over them today that we use for shipping. <clears throat> on the uh, infrastructure side of things, um, uh, this information will be relevant in a bit. Uh, we do use FreeBSD on our host machines, obviously. Everything that we have is in a GL, so Git is in a GL, BuildBot is in a GL, Poudriere is in a GL, etc. Uh, Non-FreeBSD systems, mostly for testing, such as Linux, Windows, they run on Beehive hypervisor using VM Beehive. Uh, we also have what we call, you know, server SSO. So we use NES. If you don't know what NES is, good. Don't look up, don't deploy it. Just forget that I said that name. So NIST with NFS and OTOFS, we use all of those together to have a, a shared home environment in our lab. Uh, we are also a remote first company. So we have tunnels using WireGuard among multiple locations between multiple continents. Uh, now one of those locations is here, Armenia, which is not FreeBSD friendly CDN wise. And I'll talk, I'll talk about that uh, a bit later. Um, so, okay, so software development flow, um, it, it's, it's not really complex. So first of all, uh, a commit is pushed into an application repo on Git. Uh, Git sends a post request to BuildBot saying, I have a new commit. BuildBot would check the commit and locate the changes and it would run the first process, right? There's a process running uh, that would, you know, uh, say make a cloned repository, make, etc., etc. Now, during that process, um, it, it updates our post tree and, and then it triggers another process that, you know, on the right there, uh, which SSHs into Poudriere, runs commands um, and, and makes the packages. And, um, and when it's done, it goes into another process, the one in the middle, and it makes the ISOs and the VM images. I want to zoom in a bit uh, into the first part of this, uh, also known as from get to build. Uh, so uh, what BuildBot does, it clones the repository, runs some make commands. For example, it runs many mix commands for our Elixir projects, many NPM uh, commands for our uh, JavaScript projects, which would produce a tarball uh, in case of mix or a directory that we can tarball in case of NPM run build. Um, so we upload that tarball to a web server uh, where the tarball is the name of the package followed by a git hash followed by the build number. 
so it would be you know one two three four etc and we also make a sim link to that tarball named uh, the the name of the package followed by latest so that would be and we will use that in in in, uh, in, in later approaches and uh, now we use the git hash and the build number to update the ports uh, to update the ports and then we invoke sam which means shake and make so so let's see what's happening there uh, um, this is our typical port as you can see we use uh, git hash and git version for the disk name uh, what happens is after a successful build buildbot changes those macros and commits to the main branch uh, on, on, on the remote repository of, of, of the port tree. Um, now, before moving forward, I want to explain that we have a clear separation between building and packaging. Uh, that being said, we use no build macro in our ports files, which skips the build step, since building is done by buildbot. We use Poudrier only for packaging. Uh, so, speaking of packaging, when the buildbot process initiates SAM, uh, here's what happens. Poudrier server updates its local copy of the port tree from the repo that BuildBot just pushed into, and it starts building the new ports. It starts building the new ports, and that's pretty much it. So you might say, what are we shaking exactly? So, so uh, the, the SAM, the shaking and making, uh, is, is because, let's say, if you have a port tree and you want to add your own ports in there uh, globally speaking you have two options uh, option one is forking freebsd port tree adding your own stuff in there that means you will have a single port tree to use internally however you will need to update your copy uh, you, you will need to, to update your copy to keep in par with FreeBSD frequently. Now, this is a good practice if you rely on FreeBSD ports. Let's say if you're making a Python application and you want to use Py DNS package port as a dependency. Uh, the second option uh, is to have your own port tree and merge it uh, with other port trees. This is a good. Uh, this is this is good since you need to update the other port trees. For example, FreeBSD port tree only when you need to uh, however you do not you, you do need a reliable way to merge those trees together uh, this is a good practice when your software is like standalone uh, in well in our case our software is a standalone uh, it doesn't have any external dependencies um, so from a from Poudrier's perspective, you know, BuildBot builds everything and Poudrier just needs to extract them. So it made sense for us to go with the second option. Um, that's why we use port shaker, hence, you know, shaking and making. Uh, the configuration file is, is, is a single file. I mean, it's, it's covered in this man page. Um, and honestly, we've configured this like, you know, years ago once and we've never had to look at it, at it again. Um, and, and the way you run it is also simple. Um, here's a simple run copied from our scripts. Uh, update the company's port tree, that's dash u. Merge all the port trees into default, which by the way, is Poudrier's port tree named default, and then run Poudrier bulk to build the company ports on a GL named company devil 130, that's, you know, for FreeBSD 13.0, using the port tree default. So merge it, run bulk, that's it. Um, okay, so let's see uh, where we're at now. We have a CI pipeline that builds. Poudrier that packages and everything else is automated. What we still need is a package server via HTTP, ideally with authentication. Now I will not cover the web server setup. That's all in Poudrier's man page on, on, on how to put the proper configuration in Nginx and Apache to have it uh, all done. However, my only last recommendation is there is that you will need to use something like HT access. So um, let's talk about PIP pkgconf with http auth so you can place your own uh, repositories configuration in the user local uh, etc pkg repos example.conf and which has the following content it, it has the name of the repo followed by its options such as the url um, it's enabled and we can now use environment variables for fetch 
Uh, for example, we are using HTTP auth for basic authentication where the user, uh, the username is user zero and the password is the password. So now fetch will use those environment variables to fetch the packages from your own repository. Uh, now back to Faraz where he will talk about the release process. Uh, you might be wondering how we deliver our ISO and VM images. Since we need to build neither the Word nor the kernel, we use Putrio, a small script that we have, to take care of the distributions. The process for the ISO images is that we use Putrio image, an alpha feature, not even beta. Uh, so a new feature, but mature enough, I'd say. Uh, but what it provides is a live image and not an installer. To make it so, we need to put our distribution files for base and kernel. Uh, we easily fetch them from previous mirrors, uh, but for our gobbins, on the other hand, uh, we compress them with the right hierarchy of where they reside on the system, put them next to other these files, update the manifest, and use the minus C option of the PGA image to copy them into the final image. To update the manifest file, by the way, uh, the make minus manifest of the sage is available under the release scripts of the source tree. Keep in mind things you want to copy with the minus C option need to be under a directory with the proper hierarchy. For example, to copy uh, the distribution files we discussed, since they need to be under slash user slash freebsd minus dist, the argument you give to Putrier is a path to overlay as in overlay slash user slash freebsd minus dist. Okay, now let's move on to VM images. The tricky one first, unlike ISO installers and UFS images that we cover in a bit, uh, we didn't find an easy method or a one-liner to make bootable ZFS images. And to my understanding, you can't just create a ZFS raw disk with Poudrier image and boot from that. But still, it's not black magic and you can do it with a small script. As an alternative solution, you can also leverage BSD install. We gave it a successful try, but we haven't examined all of its aspects, drawbacks, etc. Uh, but I'll try to talk about it later. Uh, for our purpose, we create a file, we create a memory disk for it via MD config, we partition the disk with GPART, create a ZFS pool, take care of the data sets and uh, their properties take care of distribution and configuration files um, by extracting them to the disk and modify the disk, export a pool and detach a memory disk. If you're on ZFS Beware, you cannot build a ZFS pool of the same name for your image. Uh, for instance, if you want your final VM images have the default Z root as the pool name and you are using the, uh, the Z root name uh, already on your own machine. Uh, we've written gport and ZFS commands we use so you can better follow the process. For UFS images, on the other hand, you only need to use a Putri A image. Here you can see an example where the minus C option is for copying any data into the final image, the minus F for installing a list of packages that uh, are previously made ready to export with Pudria bulk, minus S for the image size, minus W for swap size, uh, minus B for placing the swap first to allow growing the disk later, uh, if that's what you want, and minus T option, uh, so, sorry, minus T USB for the type. Uh, cheers for listening. That's all from me. Let's get back to Antronic. Um, okay, thank you for us. Uh, so uh, now I'm gonna talk about how we do our releases. Since we don't modify the kernel and we don't modify the user land, we use Pudrier image. Um, uh, here's a look at our custom tree. Uh, it has our repo configuration. It has our latest packages. You remember when we made the symlinks of, of the upload? Well, that's why we made the symlinks. Now we can just fetch them automatically. 
uh, and um, and let's also have a look at our, of, of our uh, overlay. It has the FreeBSD dist files plus our dist file, the one that we just saw, an RC local file in etc, and the shell script named custom installer. Uh, you see FreeBSD boots by running etcrc, but after etcrc is done, FreeBSD executes rc.local. So let's have a look at our rc.local. Uh, and as you can see, it asks typical questions that you would see when you're installing FreeBSD, you know, such as your terminal. Uh, and then it will just immediately run the custom installer. Now on FreeBSD, it would run BSD install. And in our case, we're, we just, we're, we're just running a modified version of BSD install. Um, so the custom installer here is made of two main parts. First, it uses dialog to ask the user some questions such as the, uh, the setting the host name, choosing a disk or, or, or for, for where you want to install things into, um, network configuration, etc. And we save those answers inside some variables. Then we generate a script uh, that can be uh, used by the BSD script command BSD install script command. The script is also made of two parts. Uh, first are environment variables uh, used by BSD install, uh, such as which dist files we need to install. Um, uh, as you can see, we have the base, the kernel and custom. Uh, which disk to install into, you know, that we defined from the user's answer uh, and uh, things such as uh, the uh, ZFS datasets um, that we need to create. We can make custom ZFS datasets. We also, we also use the non-interactive uh, non environment variables, so BSD install would not ask any more questions. Uh, and the second part, which is divided by a shebang, followed by the interpreter, in this case it's, you know, just bsh, are the commands that are going to be run inside the installed system, uh, such as setting the hostname, uh, let's say enabling SSH, uh, PKG bootstrap, uh, so you can have PKG installed in the system. Now, um, here's a nice trick that um, I spent some time on it. Uh, as you can see, we've, we've defined the repos dear environment variable set to etc pkg otherwise it, it, it would have used our custom repo which is not configured yet the credentials are empty for now uh, then you know the, the customer would be filling them later so you you set it to repos dear so it will use the free bsd uh, the, the, the the package repo defined with freebsd uh, then we do pkg add into our latest packages so at, at this point now we have our packages installed as well um, we can do more things such as enabling those services by default and uh, ending everything with 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 the password there. so the user would set a password for for root and um, now that all of this is generated, we put it into a location such as uh, tmp install.script. And in the end of our custom installer, we run bsd install script tmp install.script. And uh, that's it. Now bsd install would, would run those typical commands, you know, uh, partitioning, uh, setting ZFS. Uh, the data sets, uh, extracting the dist files, and then it would run the commands that we've already defined into that system, and it would close and end. Uh, you can do more things after that. You can ask the user to, you know, go to the live CD that FreeBSD does, or maybe reboot, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, if you do encounter an error, however, it will display the error in a dialog box, so you would know exactly what went wrong. Uh, so this covers the ISO and the USB images with an installer. Uh, let's go to VM images. Uh, for VM images, we do something um, simple. First, we make sure that we are using UFS. Uh, so so first, first thing first, we truncate to make a disk file. Uh, then we use mdconfig to create a memory disk. After that, we just copy the previously generated script uh, you know, the install.script file, and we run it separately. Now, we will need to hard code some variables here, such as the ZFS boot disks would be, you know, not user defined, but uh, MD0, because now we're using a memory disk. Um, and, and the rest is pretty much the same. So the reason why you need a UFS system is that when making a ZFS VM image, at some point, BSD install exports all the zipples. I'm not sure why, 
Uh, I'm not sure if that's even required uh, or maybe it's legacy something left. Uh, but in either case, if you do know, please let us know. Um, that, that, that's why you require a system with, with UFS. Uh, don't try running that by accident on ZFS on production. Bad things might happen. Um, so, so here are some unforeseen issues that we've encountered. Uh, first, when you truncate those images, while you define it to be, let's say, 10 gigs, uh, and you've actually used, and your actual use the space is smaller. Uh, a typical FreeBSD install would be no more than 500 megabytes. However, if you try to SCP these images, it will require you to move all 10 gigabytes. And a, a, a simple workaround of this would be to convert those disks to something like VMDK or QCAL using ChemU image. It's in the uh, ChemU tools package, and then moving them. So as you remember, we use Beehive as our hypervisor, and when we need to test those images, uh, we need to you know, convert them to QCAL, move them to the other location, and then convert them back to RAW, so Beehive can boot them, because Beehive can only boot uh, RAW disk images. Uh, the second weird problem that we, that we, that we encountered is that uh, when we were using Poudrier image, it kept complaining that it requires a gel with a kernel, and our first thought was to extract kernel into the jail that Poudrier was using, you know, the dash J flag. And Poudrier kept complaining. After reading the source code, however, we realized that the solution was actually to extract kernel.txz into the jail that Poudrier was installed in. And as you remember, we use jails for everything. So there's a jail that has Poudrier, and Poudrier is creating another jail. To, to build the images. So you need the kernel in both places, both the, the kernel, both, both in the jail that Poudrier is in and the jail that Poudrier is using. So keep that in mind so you don't spend two hours uh, for that issue. Um, so, uh, so before moving forward, here are some links to GitHub pages, repositories, man pages, um, locate, locate paths in your system that would be helpful for you. Uh, the first one is Poudrier's image um, man page. Uh, the, the next two are uh, OCAM BSD by Michael Dexter, is to make a minimalistic free BSD image uh, that you can learn a lot by reading and contributing to the code and also imagine that makes custom free BSD images. Uh, and, and there's also a script by Moin that we've learned a lot from on, on how the free, on how to make VM images as well. Uh, you can use that if you want to make ZFS images for Vulter, for example. Um, so uh, here are two paths that you need to look into if you want to make your custom installer. It's, it's, it's the BSD install path as well as the BSD config path. Keep in mind that BSD install uses BSD config as its core. So, you know, you will need to go back and forth a lot to understand what the code is doing. Uh, so I hope those scripts and, and links would be helpful for you. Um, uh, okay, so keep in mind that using FreeBSD is only half the work as a vendor. You also have to upstream things because, you know, sharing is caring. And the better FreeBSD is, the better your product will be. Uh, dividing it into three parts, uh, we'll talk about source, ports, and, and docs. Uh, when you are upstreaming into source, make sure that you do good testing. Uh, keep in mind that it requires time to be merged. Uh, if your changes are large, then, then make them in a gradual way. Uh, but don't get tricked. You also need to follow up even if it's a small change. For example, I submitted the jail.conf.d patch a year and a half ago, and it was, you know, three, four line of change. Um, but that small change apparently broke some people's uh, jail subsystem uh, and I had to follow up and some of those people discovered the issue maybe a year later. So always try to follow up that what your changes have done and, uh, and, and follow up with the community, uh, look into the mailing lists, etc, etc. Uh, but, but it's very important to upstream the works that should be upstreamed. It's worth it. It will, try, it will make FreeBSD better for everyone. Now on the port side of things, um, remember that those packages and the ports that you're submitting is not only for your own company, it's also, you know, we, we should have open source in our mind. Um, 
Uh, so other people are using those software as well, even if you wrote them and published them. For example, we wrote Manush, which is a configurable menu shell. Um, it takes a JSON as an input to, to make a custom menu for you. Uh, and, 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 and I wanted to use some paths that we use internally. And I have to remember that, no, this port will be used by other people. I have to use paths that make sense to everyone, not just for us that we use internally. And uh, finally, for docs, uh, Faraz has done some has done some work on on docs. However, I have been lazy and haven't spent some time into docs. Hopefully, I will do more in the future, and we will uh, be able to upstream our our changes in the docs as well. Um, so this is it. Hopefully, we've covered everything that you need to get started as a FreeBSD vendor. If you do have any questions, let us know. Email website. Uh, right now in IRC, Zoom, I don't know what else we have, Twitter, etc. Uh, that's all folks and um, have a good conference.